met and approved. morning everyone. You'll notice there's a, a new liturgical movement and that is that um, given the live streaming and the mics being on and off, we are much more conscious. So just understand we are prayerfully looking at our wireless packs. Uh, part of the conditions of reopening is that we need to make these announcements. Thank you, John. Oh, here. Sorry, by Lex's mic. <laughs> you're not on the camera if you're not there. Okay. Um, uh, good, morning, good morning and welcome back, everybody. Um, uh, as we meet again uh, amidst ongoing challenges, we need to remind ourselves of the steps we're taking to keep us all healthy and safe. Um, for the congregation, uh, please make sure that you register on arrival and sanitise your hands and are sitting in an assigned seat or with a member of your host household as close to the front as possible. When we get into the greetings of peace, please make that greeting in your place 
and without any physical contact with others. The offertory plates will not be passed around. There is one at the back and one at the front to use as you come up for communion. At communion, only the celebrant will receive the wine and you'll be ushered one pew at a time. Please continue to socially distance yourselves in a single file to the centre. We won't kneel at the altar rails for now. After the service, similar to, commun similar to communion, if the backmost people can exit first, as socially distancing as possible, and filter up to the front. There's a plastic tub for your prayer books, and if you can leave by the side door rather than the big sliding door. Um, thank you all for your support. This continues to be a challenge for us all, and we give thanks that we can do what we can do when so many can't. Thank you very much. Thanks, John. And um, welcome to those at home. A number um, are still feeling vulnerable or <coughs> for other reasons are not with us. The numbers do restrict, so we're going to continue to live stream something that we hope we will continue um, into the future, but perhaps slightly less clumsy. Um, today I'd like to welcome back the choir. As you know, we've been able to sing for the last two weeks, so that's a huge um, lifting of the restrictions, and I felt that we could comfortably um, sit six members of the choir socially distanced, and uh, so uh, welcome back. Would you all like to stand, Rosalind? Pardon? You need to speak, Michael, because I've got no idea what your signalling is. Sorry, this is this is the new system. Why? Okay, well, we didn't do that before. And this is set up so that next week when we have rostered readers, we're not sharing mics. So I don't need my mic and that mic. So now you can see me, lovely, at home, lovely, welcome and good morning. Um, would you please stand and we'll sing our first hymn, 430, the words are in the pew bulletin.
Messiah is known, and from whom no secrets are hidden. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to God's people on earth. Lord God, Heavenly King, Almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world, have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father, receive our prayer. For you alone are the Holy One, you alone are the Lord, you alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. Let us pray. O God, your Son has taught us that those who give a cup of water in his name will not lose, that's the wrong one. Bountiful God, whose wanton abandon leads to growth beyond our ability to imagine, help us to confidently share your word, heedless of where it lands, confident that in the right soil it will thrive and grow, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Would you be seated? Our first reading is from the book of Genesis, chapter 25, beginning at the 19th verse. These are the descendants of Isaac, Abraham's son. Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac was 40 years old when he married Rebekah, daughter of Bethuel, the Aramean of Adaram, sister of Laban, the Aramean. Isaac prayed to the Lord, his wife, because she was barren. And the Lord granted his prayer, and his wife, Rebekah, conceived. The children struggled together within her, and she said, it is for, If it is for to be this way, why do I live? So she went to inquire of the Lord, and the Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb, and the peoples born of you shall be divided. One shall be stronger than the other. The elder shall serve the younger. When her time to birth to give birth was at hand, there were twins in her womb. The first came out red, all his body like a hairy mantle. So they named him Esau. Afterwards, his brother came out with his hand gripping Esau's heel. So he was named Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when she bore them. When the boys grew up, Esau was a skillful hunter, a man of the field, while Jacob was a quiet man living in tents. Isaac loved Esau because he was fond of game. But Rebekah loved Jacob. Once when Jacob was cooking a stew, Esau came in from the field and he was famished. Esau said to Jacob, Let me eat some of that red stuff, for I am famished. Therefore he was called Edom. Jacob said, First sell me your birthright. Esau said, I'm about to die. Of what use use is the birthright to me? Jacob said, Swear to me first. So he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and lentil stew, and he ate and drank 
and rose and went his way. Then thus Esau despised his birthright. Hear the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our psalm is Psalm 119, verses 105 to 112, and the choir will lead us. Our second reading is Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 8, beginning at the first verse. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. For God has done with the law, for, for God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and to deal with sin, he condemned sin in the flesh, so that the just requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on things of the Spirit. To set the mind on flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. For this reason, the mind that is set on flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, indeed it cannot, and those who are in the flesh cannot please God. But you are not in the flesh, you are in the Spirit, since the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. If the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will give you life to your mortal bodies also through his spirit that dwells in you. Hear the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please stand. The 
Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew, chapter 13, beginning at the first verse. Glory to you, Lord Jesus Christ. That same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat beside the lake. Such great crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat there, while the whole crowd stood on the beach. And he told them many things in parables, saying, Listen, a sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seeds fell on the path, and the birds came and ate them up. Other seeds fell on rocky ground, where they did not have much soil, and they sprang up quickly, since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched, and since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil and brought forth grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. Let anyone with ears listen. Hear then the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what is sown in the heart. This is what was sown on the path. As for what was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet such a person has no root, but endures only for a while. And when trouble or persecution arises on account of the word, that person immediately falls away. As for what was sown among thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the lure of wealth choke the word, and it yields nothing. But as for what was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and yields, in one case a hundredfold, in another sixty, and in another thirty. For the Gospel of the Lord, praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. May I speak in the name of our God of abundant life. Amen. Please be seated. Last weekend, there was a major event in the world of online, cinematic, and theatrical entertainment. Hamilton, an American musical, the film, was released on Disney+. Plus. If you haven't heard of the musical, it tracks the life of Alexander Hamilton, the first American Treasury Secretary. And a major factor in its fame and success is that it is told extraordinarily well through hip-hop music, not traditional Broadway-style Broadway music. The story of the musical charts Hamilton's life from his childhood in the Caribbean, immigration to America, participation in the Revolutionary War alongside George Washington and the Marquis de Lafayette, involvement in creating and defending the Constitution of the United States, ups and downs in his personal life, and above all, his rivalry with Aaron Burr. Burr's claim to fame is that he served as vice president under Thomas Jefferson. But he is more infamous for the fact that he ultimately killed Hamilton in a duel. Burr had called Hamilton out over a seemingly insignificant insult. But in fact, it was the last in a long line of injuries as he saw it. He felt that every time he had failed, Every time he missed out on opportunity or recognition, it was because Hamilton was taking it all. At the end of the musical, just after the duel, Burr realizes too late the enormity of his action and laments, I should have known 
the world was wide enough for both Hamilton and me. The Hamilton and Burr story of rivalry, ambition, and pride is not unique, though not all such stories are played out on a public scale and with such tragic conclusions. Perhaps even some of us can relate to feeling rejected or deprived because of someone else's success. Now consider the story from Genesis we just heard, in which Esau sells his birthright to Jacob for a bowl of stew. What was his birthright? It would probably have included authority, headship of the clan, and up to a double portion of the fiscal inheritance, and possibly even other privileges. Not an insignificant matter. In addition, as the firstborn son of Isaac, son of Abraham, Esau was first in line to inherit the covenant that God made with Abraham. In Genesis 17, God said to Abraham, Your wife Sarah shall bear you a son, and you shall name him Isaac. I will establish my covenant with him as an everlasting covenant for his offspring after him. As a twin, I expect Jacob had been looking at this inheritance rather jealously. Only a matter of luck that Esau was born that much earlier. And several of the commentaries I read on this passage focus on criticizing Esau for his carelessness when it came to this divine birthright in particular. I mean, maybe it was just a really good bowl of soup. And perhaps the hindsight that comes from the later narrative of Scripture, Jacob's journey to becoming Israel and the father of the twelve tribes, giving us the third patriarch, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. Perhaps this is what drives that interpretation, suggesting Esau deserved to lose his birthright and blessing since he was so careless with them. On the other hand, it is worth pointing out that Jacob, through his mother Rebekah, already had the promise of God. Two nations are in your womb, and two peoples born of you shall be divided. The one shall be stronger than the other. The elder shall serve the younger. Now, it's not like the narrative will let Jacob off the hook for his schemes and deceptions. But why in this instance did he need to resort to such tactics? Was it a case of predestination that this deception was inevitable? Was he just doing his part to enact God's plan? Or was it impatience and greed? Why didn't he just give his brother a bowl of stew? I wonder what God's plan for the two brothers, the elder serving the younger, might have looked like without Jacob's manipulation and deception. I wonder if this is related to the way our society, society has convinced us that there is only so much prestige and power to go around, only so many resources, and that we therefore need to compete to claim our share of it and then defend it so someone else doesn't steal it. Some people even seem to think there is only so much of God's love to go around. Many of you will be familiar with the parable of the sower in this Sunday's Gospel reading. In my experience, and maybe in yours, it is easy to focus on the fate of the seeds, eaten by birds, choked by thorns, or fortunate enough to fall on fertile ground and produce abundant grain. We proceed to criticize the state of our own spiritual ground, and even judge that of others, like Esau's. We focus on the things that appear to stand in the way of us receiving God's love. The thing to remember, though, is that Jesus' parables are intended to tell us something about God, not just to criticize us. 
Debbie Thomas reminds us that we call it the parable of the sower, not the parable of the four terrains. We are good at making things all about us. But what this parable tells us, like so many others do, is that our God is an extravagant God. God is not a gardener who reads the instructions on the packet of seeds about how deep or how far apart to plant the seeds. It is not about when to plant them, whether to put them in full or partial sun or shade, or how often to water them. This gardener God just scatters the seeds by the handful, knowing that some will grow and produce in abundance. You only need to look at the natural world world God created to see evidence of seed thriving in the least likely conditions. There is nothing wrong with planning and pruning and cultivating, as it were. Nothing wrong with honest and humble self-assessment in our spiritual lives and attempts to improve ourselves. But at the same time, who am I to tell God the creator of the earth and all that is in it, what good soil looks like. Who am I to decide who is worthy and who is not of the sower's generosity? Who am I to hoard what I have been so freely and lavishly given? Who am I to look at God's profligate blessing and call it waste? Yes, we hope to be good, fertile soil, ready to receive the word and grace of God. But we are also called to be sowers, as extravagant as God, flinging handfuls of gospel joy throughout the wide, wide world. Such is the result of abundant growth. Such should be our response to a love and a grace that surely is wide enough to hold both thee and me. Page 123, let us together stand and affirm the faith of the Church. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made, for us and for our salvation. He came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake he was crucified on a conscious pile. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. From from again to glory, judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one's forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us pray for the world and for the church. The response to the bidding, Spirit of God, is hear our prayer. Spirit of God, hear our prayer.
Spirit of God, hear our prayers for your world and for your church. We pray for the peoples of the world, for those oppressed by harsh governments, those who live under foreign rule, for those in countries destroyed by war, and for the dispossessed. Spirit of peace, grow in us. Teach us to resolve our differences without violence and cruelty, that wars may cease and all your people learn to live in harmony. Spirit of God, hear our prayer. We pray for the leaders of tribes and nations, for all who make and administer law, for all who hold positions of civil authority and trust. Spirit of wisdom, grow in them. Guide them in your way of insight that they may carry out their responsibilities without favour or self-interest. Spirit of God, hear our prayer. We pray for your church, for leaders, councils and synods of churches, for your ministers and all who proclaim your gospel by deed or word. Spirit of truth, grow in us, give us ears to hear, eyes to see and hearts to understand that we may receive your word and bear much fruit to your glory. Spirit of God, hear our prayer. We pray for this community, for those who whom we live and work, learn and play, for our family, our friends and for ourselves. Spirit of love, grow in us. Help us to reach out in welcome to those around us that we may build relationships of mutual affection, trust, generosity and respect. Spirit of God, hear our prayer. We pray for all who are in need, for those who live in poverty, those who suffer rejection or discrimination, for those in anxiety or grief, the sick, all who care for them. Spirit of compassion, increase in us concern for one another, that with warm and open hearts, we may bring care and comfort to your people. Spirit of God, hear our prayer. We give thanks for the faithful departed, for those who have received and understood your word, for your people from this parish whose yearly remembrance occurs at this time. Spirit of life, grow in us. Set us free from all that keeps us in debt, that with your servants in every age we may be raised to everlasting life. Spirit of God, hear our prayer. Spirit of God, accept our prayers through Jesus Christ our Lord, who taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. The words you have spoken are spirit and life, O Lord. You you have the words of eternal life. Page 125, let us pray. We do not presume to come to your table, merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, 
but in your manifold and great mercies. We are not worthy so much to gather up the crumbs under your table, but you are the same Lord, whose nature is always to have mercy. Grant us, therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the flesh of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood, that we may evermore dwell in him and he in us. Amen. Page 126. God is steadfast in love and infinite in mercy, welcoming sinners and inviting them to the Lord's table. Let us confess our sins in penitence and faith, confident in God's forgiveness. Merciful God, our Maker and our Judge, we have sinned against you in thought, word and deed and in what we have failed to do. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbours as ourselves. We repent and are sorry for all our sins. Father, forgive us. Strengthen us to love and obey you in newness of life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Mighty God, who has promised forgiveness to all who turn to him in faith, pardon you and set you free from all your sins, strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in eternal life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Would you stand? We are the body of Christ. Peace of the Lord be always with you. Peace be with you. And this is a good opportunity for some education. <coughs> The offertory hymn is about setting the altar. So we can still have an offertory hymn because your offering will be placed in a place at the back or at the front. So remember that. Hymn 439, again it's in your pew bulletin. Thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. And 
Glory and honour be yours always and everywhere, mighty Creator, ever-living God. We give you thanks and praise for our Saviour, Jesus Christ, who by the power of your Spirit was born of Mary and lived as one of us. By his death on the cross and rising to new life, he offered the one true sacrifice for sin and obtained an eternal deliverance for his people. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we proclaim your great and glorious name, forever praising you and saying, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Merciful God, we thank you for these gifts of your creation, this bread and wine, and we pray that by your word and Holy Spirit, we who eat and drink them may be partakers of Christ's body and blood. On the night he was betrayed, Jesus took bread, and when he had given you thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup, and again giving you thanks, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Therefore, we do as our Saviour has commanded, proclaiming his offering of himself, made once for all upon the cross, mighty resurrection and glorious ascension, and looking for his coming again, we celebrate with this bread and this cup his one perfect and sufficient sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. Renew us by your Holy Spirit, unite us in the body of your Son, and bring us with all your people into the joy of your eternal kingdom, through Jesus Christ our Lord, with whom and in whom, in the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, we worship you, Father, in songs of never-ending praise. Blessing and honour and glory and power are yours forever and ever. Amen. We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. We who are many are one body, for we all share in one bread. Jesus, Lamb of God, have mercy on us. Jesus, bearer of our sins, have mercy on us. Jesus, redeemer of the world, grant us your peace. The gifts of God for the people of God. Come, let us take this holy sacrament of the body and blood of Christ in remembrance that he died for us and feed on him in our hearts by faith with thanksgiving.
body of Christ, the bread of heaven. The body of Christ, the bread of heaven. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you that in this sacrament you assure us of your goodness and love. Accept our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving and help us to grow in love and obedience that we may serve you in the world and finally be brought to that table where all your saints feast with you forever. Most loving God, you send us into the world you love. Give us grace to go thankfully and with courage in the power of your Spirit. May God of abundant love give you generosity in your heart towards yourselves and towards others that all may know the boundlessness of God's love and grace. The blessing of God Almighty, Creator, Redeemer and Sanctifier be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen. But before you do, I will warn you that during the singing of the hymn, I'll turn the camera around so that people at home can feel that they are part of you. I'd also like to, on your behalf, wish Rosemary a happy birthday for last Tuesday. And we wish Marion a happy birthday for tomorrow. <laughs> the hymn is Joyful, Joyful. What a wonderful note to go out on today. Stand with Jane.